Oh, yeah. oh, no, no, no. Now, now after, after, after listening to Dad, you Zach, feel better? Excuse me, come back next week. Back to the end. Okay. All right. All right, well, all right Dana. You ready? So here we go. All right. <laughs> it's all downhill from me. The Big Fat American Rock Show spares no expense using the finest reel-to-reel machines, eight tracks, cassettes, and vinyl. Broadcasting from a state-of-the-art 1955-era rock and roll bomb shelter. Here's your crazy uncle, Zach Martin. This is part two. We're talking about Nefcure and uh, what Nefcure does. And I think one of the most important people in a child's life has got to be good old mom. And the reason why we want to have Dana talk about her experience going through each and every day with Matthew is because you know as well as I do that somebody is going to get that devastating diagnosis. They're going to be in the same shoes. They're going to look for someone that they could go to, get some advice from people that have similar experiences. Take us to that moment when you find out that Matthew has FSGS. And I, I guess you get the first wave where it really hits you. And then at what point did you start to say, okay, this is the situation now, what's my next step? Um, I actually, I'm going to answer your question, but it really went before I got the diagnosis is when the panic really set in. I got a phone call from our, my pediatrician. So Matthew had an ear infection. So while he was checking his ear, I mentioned to the pediatrician that his eyes were getting swollen. And uh-huh. they were only swollen for about three hours a day, just in the morning when he woke up. And then they were fine. And my pediatrician, without even alarming me at all, said, you know what? Let's just do a protein blood test and we'll check him out. I said, fine. He called me two days later in a complete panic. The doctor was the panicked? Doc- doctor oh, my was gosh. Panicked. You know it's bad he when the was, doctor's he panicking. Was panic. he oh, said, man. Matthew's in kidney failure. You need to come to my office, get his records, and bring him to Schneider's Children's Hospital right away. And I said to him right away, you have the wrong kid. That's not my son. He's fine. He's at school. He's having a great time. There is nothing wrong with him. He said, Dana, get him there right now. I already made you an appointment with a nephrologist. And I called Mike and I said, our doctor doesn't know what he's talking about. And I don't even know what a nephrologist is. And we have to go to Schneider's. Schneider's, And I'm from New Jersey. I don't even know where it is. We had just moved to Long Island. So he's our, let's go. So I pick up Matthew and we went. And at first... They said, okay, he's just going to go on some prednisone and hopefully he'll be okay. Mm. So we tried that for six weeks and then that didn't work and we did a kidney biopsy. And that's, and that whole six weeks, I was just hopeful, like, okay, the doctor said, I'm going to give him this medicine. He's going to be okay. Mm-hmm. We were optimistic. And then we went to the hospital and, oh, it didn't work. So then we had a kidney biopsy. And then the next day, the doctor called me and he said, you need to come and make an appointment. You need to come see us right away. So all of a sudden, heart starts racing, my throat closes up, we're in trouble. When the doctor Mm. wants you to come, you know you're in trouble. So we went to the office and they said, your son has FSGS. Mike and I never even heard of these letters before. We had no idea what to do and we were panicking. And honestly, I mean, I think the both of us as a team just said, we're going to fix this. This is our son and we have to figure it out. Mm -hmm. And for the last... 14 years, that's what we've been doing. There's yeah. been a lot of tears. There's been so many hard times. Um, but every day we get up and we, and we figure out what are we going to do today? What are we going to do? Who are we going to talk to? How are we going to fix this? Mm. How are we going to make our son okay? And, you know, Mike and I work very hard together, but he's the businessman. So he goes out and he makes all the phone calls and he's on his, you know, emailing everybody all day, all night, who can help us. And I'm the one at home. And I always say my job is to make sure that our house is a happy place. Okay. And if he wakes up and he's happy and he feels good, that day is a good day. If he wakes up and he doesn't feel well right away, what am I going to do to make this day good? Even if he doesn't feel well. Where are we going to go? What are we going to do? What are we going to eat? How am I going to put a smile on my son's face? And when you say, yes, moms fake it, I fake it all the time. Well, I always suspect that <laughs> moms fake it. You know, We fake it all the time. Yeah. And my friends always say to me, how do you have a <laughs> smile on your face all the time? How are you happy all the time? And you know what? I do because my son is amazing. He makes me laugh. You know, And that's the other great thing about 
Matthew, and I, and I see it with a lot of kids that are sick. They are happy. Mm. They are happy kids. And, you know, he really doesn't, doesn't bother him what he's missing out on. If he can't go to a party, he can't go to somebody's house, he can't have a sleepover. He's okay with whatever he can do at that time. Mm-hmm. And he doesn't feel like he's missing out. And then when he feels good... Then he goes full force and he does everything that he has to do. But when he doesn't feel well, we take care of him. All right. So he knows his limitations. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. One of the scary things that I would hear from Michael uh, on occasion when he would talk about his blood pressure. Uh-huh. Oh, my gosh. I mean, like like high blood pressure is like 300 over 200, right? Am I not making right. this no, up, right? I'm I mean, I got that. Up. Absolutely. And, I, and I've always had to deal with high blood pressure my entire life. So I'm always on medicines for that. Mm-hmm. And you know, it gets to be, you know, I don't know if Matthew does this. I'll have to ask him. But sometimes I might be on six or seven different medicines all to deal with the blood pressure. So obviously I have a, some sort of kidney thing that, that's going on, right? right. Um, and, and sometimes I'm like, you know, what? I just don't feel like taking this flipping medicine anymore. I just like, when does it end? You know, or, um, y- y- you know, I, I start to panic. I'll get into the panic mode, but I don't have my mom to, she would laugh at me, right? right? You know, you she would call like, me. oh, well, well that's, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, my mom would, uh, my mom always had that sense of humor, even when she found out she had renal carcinoma. It's like gallows humor. I'm like, ma, really inappropriate right now. <laughs> and a disc jockey telling her that who was a, she was a big fan of Howard Stern. Mm-hmm. So she would think Howard Stern was funny. Right. My dad was like, that's the horrible stuff. I can't believe you listened to that, Eleanor. <laughs> it was going on all the time. Um, so yeah, sense of humor is a really important thing. Uh, there's something else that you talked about off the air, which I think is really important and that's taking it one day at a time. Right. Yes. We definitely take it one day at a time. I think that, you know, we, I'm a big planner. What should we do for this vacation? What should we do this weekend? You know, where are we going later? And now I'm really... We're, we're day to day, and I spend a lot of time making sure that every day is a full day, mm-hmm. a full day of fun. Even oh, well, are you I'm the, the activity director? I'm the oh, activity great. director. And my kids make fun of me, and Mike makes fun <laughs> of me, and I'm like, let's get up and out, up and yeah. out. You know, let's not waste any time, and today's a good day, and who knows? I don't know what tomorrow's going to bring. He might wake up, and we might be rushed to the hospital, and we might be there for months. So who knows? Yikes. So we need to think about what are we going to do to make sure that every day is a fun day? And I think my kids, you know, now have that in them. You know, like, let's let's enjoy. Let's enjoy every moment. And you know what? He, you know, Matthew would always say to me, why do I have to take all these pills? You know, he didn't always Oh, so he's sick. being a scooch like I would be. Right, exactly. Yeah. And he didn't always feel sick. You know, mm. he didn't always, so he didn't know why he needed to take th- this medicine, mm. you know, and I would always say to him, everybody's got something at some point in their life. And right now, this is your something and you need to wow. take care of it. I like that. You mom, like that? mom is uh, a <laughs> Miss Wisdom here. Mrs. Wisdom. That's great. Sometimes I come up with good ones. That's a good one. <laughs> but, what are some of, now, let, let's just recap. So if. You're a mom and you find out this devastating news. You're going to go through the whole grief and all of those things. And I guess you're going to research and your mind is going to play tricks on you. It's always going to give you probably the worst case scenario. And then you're, you're seeing yourself, you know, teary eyed in the black dress, right? You know, those, those horrible images that go before you and every parent's nightmare, I'd guess, would be to outlive their children, right? right. The normal things that you think of. Meanwhile, the kid is probably like, I don't know why you're worried about all of that. Uh, what's, what's going on here? Um, and it, I guess it, it's like a, this grainy black and white flick that's going through your mind. You just can't believe it. So how can you, if somebody listening, what is the key that you would say after everything we talked about, the key to making it through that day? Because now you're at home. You're not like your husband, Mike, who's working on business projects and being able to do this, that, and the other thing and take his mind off of it. You're the mom. Mom's complete, usually completely, they're focused on the kids, the house, maybe, you know, what's for dinner, all of those things that, that, that happen for mom. And she's like by herself a lot of times. How do you, how do you make it the most out of it? And like, I guess, how do you make life a little bit easier to deal with? 
Right. With all of those things going on at the same time, plus the worry. Right. The worry never goes away, ever, ever. But I do. I keep, just like I teach my kids, stay busy, stay happy, do things that make you happy. Um, you know, I'm a teach. I was a teacher. Oh, that's good. Manhattan, so now I, you know, I made sure that I kept pursuing that. I tutor. I find pick up little jobs here and there. I make sure that I keep myself busy. Okay. I make sure I keep myself happy. I make sure that I take care of myself. I work out every day. I eat well. And you know, another thing with with that is is that I don't know if he's going to need a kidney transplant or when he needs a kidney transplant. And I want to make sure that I could be a donor for I him. see. So yeah, I make that makes sure sense. that my health is good. That's very important to me because when that day comes, I want them to be able to say that if, I, if, if that day comes. If that and day when, comes. Yes, if that day comes, I want to make sure that I could be able to give him my kidney if we were a match. And the other thing is... I get through the day a lot. Now I'm going to cry, Zach. It's okay. Cry. <laughs> Is something that my husband said to me when we first found out. <laughs> and I think that I, I definitely say this to myself at least one or two times a day. Okay. And he probably doesn't even know that it made such an impact. But years ago when we first found out and... You know, he was a rock, and then I was a mess, and then, you know, I would be okay, and then he was upset, and we kind of, you know, were helping each other. And I said to him, you know, why do you think this happened to us? Like, oh, gosh, yeah. Why did this happen to us? How did we get this? How did mm. we get here? And he said to me, because we can make a difference, and that's mm. why. And that statement really stuck with me out of anything that anybody has said to me in the last— 14 years, that one statement has made a difference in my life and, mm. and said, okay, we can make a difference for everybody that needs help. And that's our job now. Mm -hmm. You know, before when little things didn't matter, where were we going to eat? What coat are we going to buy? Where are we going to go on vacation? All those things really don't matter anymore. I will add to that in that there's sometimes in life you're dealt with situations and, um, Without making it about me, but here's, here's my take on that. I often said, well, why is it somebody else's job? And what I mean about that, and I, I have this spiritual connection with God. That's, we could talk about that if you like. And I read about these biblical characters, whether it's Moses, whether it's Noah, whether it's Jonah, whether it's Isaiah, whether it's Jesus or Paul the Apostle, or Peter, Mary the Mother of God. And I find myself in situations that I, I don't feel like it, I'm the one that's to be doing this, to, to take on this mm -hmm. responsibility. And I, and I talked to a friend of mine, he goes, well, why do you think it's not your responsibility? How do you know that's not God asking you, that you're the one, that you're the, you know, the next generation Noah or the next generation Jonah or whatever it might be. It's you. And that, that really like ignited this passion that I have for making a difference. It's, it's not somebody else's job. So on top of what your husband said, that's so true. And, and that's probably the healthiest way to look at it instead of going, why me? And like, okay, you know what? I know that this is why I am created like I am because I can deal with this and really make a difference for other people. And that's what I really admire about your whole family. It's never been about just Matthew or about Dana or about Michael and your daughter's name is Sydney. Sydney. How about that? <laughs> it, even Sydney, I think she's going to Syracuse, right? Right. She goes and to she's school. learning how to be an educator, correct? Yeah. And See, this I remember summer, that. She's about, working about at that? Um, yeah, she's working at Sunrise Day Camp, which is okay. a camp for children who have cancer and their siblings. I'd like to ask you, and this is really probably as about as intimate a person can be, what conversation did you have with God, and does that help you through it at all? I have a lot of discussions with God, I guess, on my own. Not really. <laughs> oh, I have them all not the time. In a, not yeah. in a special place. Just once in a while, um, I guess, when I'm alone and when I'm really thinking about what's going on. You know, I try not to take too much time to... to sit 
because I think that that makes me more upset, you know. So, but once in a while, I do when he when Matthew's having a tough day, I do say it like, "Why?" You know, I wish that it was me, and I wish it wasn't him. Like, why does he have to do this? Um, or any other child? Why does any child have to go through this? I've had my life already. I've you know had a great childhood. Went to college, married a great guy. Like I'm good, you know. I why does he get to suffer or anybody else who has a disease? Why do they get to suffer at a young age and not maybe not be able to have a happy childhood like I did? How is that fair? You know, I guess that's always my question. Why is it fair? You know, why isn't it? Why is why do they have to suffer? I wish it was me. You know, now that I was older. Um, you know, and then I then other conversations are like, please just make him okay, make him okay, so that he can grow up. You know, get married, have his own kids, and just and have a great life. That's what I wish for him. Mm-hmm. This is a good question to ask and a good question to reflect on for all of us because we all get in those situations. I've had those same conversations, believe me. And then I just go, hey, you know what? Better not think about it. Let's just have a different conversation, God. You know, like <laughs> I go from there. And then I, I always go, well, what, what is your will for me? And like, how can I serve others? So that's the conversation that I have. No matter who you are or where you're from, there's going to be a point where you're going to have that conversation and you're going to just try to figure that out. And it's going to be a back and forth. And it might take a long time, but just be patient with it. You get these little seeds of hope. That's the big deal. I, I asked one kid who's got cerebral palsy. His name is Nicky. And he lives in a wheelchair, basically. Can't do anything without the wheelchair. And he uses a communication device. And he, he paints with his feet. So he's using everything he has. And, and he doesn't have a dad anymore. His dad was killed. And he paints with his feet. So one day I go, hey, Nicky, you believe in God? He goes, yeah. I go, why? He goes, because it gives me hope. That is where I think, when I asked that kid, because he, he was in a situation like, why me? Why am I suffering? Why do I have this? Why was a medical mistake made? Why did I lose my dad? All of these questions that we all have. And Nikki goes, it gives me hope. So I think that that, if anything else, there's always hope. And you just can never give up. And, and you just got to keep going at it. And, you know, take everything that you have and pour it out. Don't, don't like... Do this, you know, I'll show you. You know when people give like this? Right. <laughs> drip it out. It, it, no, well, we can they, never, they, we can right. never give up because you can't. You can't. But, you but what I'm showing you, how the, it drips out of, the, of this bottle here, that's no way to give. This is the way to give because it's all going to end up, the end result is, is going to be, you know, empty. Right. right? So just don't, like, don't hold back. And the doctors and the people with, that can make a difference with their money to go to NFCure, don't hold back. You just got to, you got to give as much as you can and do the best you can each and every day and like make the most of it. Because whether you have FSGS or not, you don't know. You guarantee, tomorrow's not guaranteed. Do you know we almost got wiped out by a meteor just a couple weeks ago? But I don't think the world's going to end anytime soon because Anytime soon, because I owe too much money to too many people. <laughs> if I ever win the, like the $100 million lottery, it's over. <laughs> That's so funny. <laughs> Pack your stuff. We're all going. <laughs> but, um, okay. Well, I do appreciate you spending some time. Um, again, we'll, we'll tell people what they can do. That We have the gala coming up, or the gala. That's in November, November 14th. You can get more information about that at nefcured.org. You can also, if you're um, part of a corporation, uh, it's it's a worthy cause. And like your husband said, was it one in five people? One in five have... Actually, one in every two or one in every three Americans will now battle <clears throat> chronic kidney disease in their lifetime. So one in every three, one every two. A lot of people are going to be battling some sort of chronic kidney disease. And what we don't think is chronic that we just slough off like, oh, it's just kidney stones. That's an issue. Um, I know more and more people that are on dialysis and then we have these drugs that are emerging because of the research with FSGS. So please give what you can and as often as you can and volunteer your time. If you don't have money, you can always volunteer some of your time and work with the organization and uh, send out those emails. And, you know, there's all kinds of things that you can do. And there is nefcure.org. Do you have an email by any chance that people can reach you guys? One last thing before you go. What is that, that your, your favorite recipe that you, you know, your, your macaroni and cheese for the brain or your favorite recipe that you like to cook 
that just always makes you feel good about the day. I have a recipe for for happy living. Okay, what is that? that? That's good. Okay, my recipe for happy living, really, is, and I learned this. I learned this the hard way because Matthew was sick, but is sick. My recipe is really for living is having a great support system and having a lot of friends around you who want to help. And it is always so hard for Mike and I to ask for help. We don't want to ask for help. We don't want to bother anybody. And I have to say that over all these years, I have really learned that it's okay to ask for help. And as a mom, I'm telling all the moms out there, if you need help, you just ask for it. And you will be surprised at how many people come running and knocking on your door to say, oh, I, I have a friend who can help or, or here, I'll cook you dinner because I know you don't like to cook or let's go take a walk. And I really have to thank all my friends and my family for all the phone calls and all the support. And it, it means a lot. And when they need something, I go running to them. That's just good. Just like they came to run to I like me. that. See, that's good advice. That's a good that's recipe. That's my recipe yeah. for life. <laughs> Ask for help. That's Ask great. Ask for help. Hamburger helper. That's a good one. All right. <laughs> I'll try that. Follow BFA on Facebook at Big Fat America. Zach Martin on Twitter at Zach Martin Rocks. And Zach Martin on Instagram. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wait, Zach is on Instagram? I can guarantee he has no clue how to use that. See all the interviews and videos at ZachMartinRocks.com.